Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to my presentation titled WebAuthn 201, How to FIDO. I'm Christian, and I'm a product manager here at Google. So before starting, let's look at a quick recap of the state of internet security. So in 2015, we saw something peculiar happening. For the first time, phishing became the dominant exploit vector over malware on the internet. And it's really been the case ever since. Uh, now, you might say that's all good and well, but that data is back from 2018. Let's look at something a bit more up to date. Well, uh, this one is a little bit more up to date. And there's also this really strange spike happening around the start of the pandemic. Um, and really at Google, we saw this trend back in 2013. And at that point, Google joined the FIDO Alliance uh, to double down on phishing resistant authentication. And at first, the focus for us was really on augmenting the password with some strong phishing resistant second factor. But in recent years, our focus has shifted towards even replacing the password and even the username with a brand new web standard. So let's talk a little bit about that web standard before we get started. Um, there is really actually two web standards that we're interested in here uh, and that we're going to discuss a little bit more today. The first one being the W3C or the World Wide Web Consortium Web Authen standard on the web. And the second one being the FIDO uh, CTAP standard, uh, which has a little bit more to do with uh, lower level of protocol information uh, between what we call authenticators and, and devices. So if we look at this, we'll see firstly that there is a web layer API between a server, typically a web server, and a, a user or a browser or a user agent here on the left. And then we have the second specification, the FIDO uh, CTAP specification, uh, client to authenticator protocol, um, which governs how data flows between a uh, particular um, user agent, the browser, a machine, platform, and then physical authenticators. Um, and in this particular presentation, we're going to be focusing a little bit more on the former than the latter. Uh, the former is more for web developers, and then the latter is more if you're interested in making uh, or producing your own authenticators that will work with the, uh, with the FIDO specification. Um, another way of kind of putting this, uh, how does FIDO and WebAuthn relate to one another? Well, we have this umbrella term called FIDO2, and under that, we then have things like the client, that's the computer or the phone. We have the W3C WebAuthn standard to the remote web server, um, and then we have different types of authenticators. Authenticators can be collect connected uh, locally, uh, as in like maybe built-in fingerprint sensors or Windows Hello and other types of, of authenticators. And then as soon as authenticators are remote, you have this uh, CTAP protocol that kind of governs the, the communication on, on that particular uh, level. Now, before we go further, let's kind of look at the basics of, of FIDO and WebAuthn and kind of how this protocol um, hangs together. So first and foremost, everything here is around user authentication. So when a user wants to sign into some remote server, typically they provide uh, some seeding information like a username and maybe even a password in some cases. And at that point, the server says, well, OK, I think I know who you are, but let's make absolutely sure. And the way that the server would make absolutely sure would be to generate a unique cryptographic challenge. And the challenge will then be sent all the way to the user's device on which they're trying to log in. So once the user device gets that challenge, uh, passes it uh, in through the browser, uh, the browser looks at that challenge and says, OK, I'm going to send it on to some FIDO authenticator. In this case, we're talking about an external uh, little USB fob that's attached to the, to the user's machine. This could very well also have been an internal platform authenticator. Doesn't really matter for the purposes of this illustration. But essentially, what happens is the browser or the platform then sends this challenge together with the calling party's ID, the uh, relying party's um, essentially web domain, the RPID ID gets sent on to that authenticator and the authenticator gets both of these pieces of information. The authenticator then looks at this and says, okay, I'm happy to now sign this challenge with a unique private key that was generated during some enrollment or registration ceremony at some point. And once this is signed, the sign challenge then gets sent all the way back to the, uh, to the client, and the client will relay that all the way to the server. And once the server validates this, the server can now basically say two things, right? The first thing that the server can say is it can say, hey, this user had in their possession a private key that I tied to the user at some point in time. So, you know, we're sure it's the user because they presented their authenticator. But secondly, we're also signing over the web origin. And that's the really important piece for phishing. Essentially, what that means is um, when the user is on Google.com, 
the browser is attesting to the fact that the user is on real google.com and not for example on fake google.com which might look like google some you know person maybe some nefarious party sent me to a url that looks just like google i type my username i type my password but because we're signing over the web origin that the client browser saw the server can now validate and be absolutely sure that the user is not duped into giving their information to some false site so we're kind of like doing away with, with like manning the middle attacks here by knowing um, whether a user is on a legitimate site versus a non-legitimate site. So you can always think about security keys or FIDO in general as the user authenticating to the remote server, but the remote server also kind of authenticating to the, to the security key or to the authenticator because that information is embedded in the web signature. And that's really the crux of how FIDO protects against uh, phishing attacks, whereby users go to lookalike URLs uh, without really being on the exact URL that, that they expect to be on. So that's kind of just a little quick primer before we get into the real meat of the day. Um, so now let's move on a little bit to this document that uh, we created and we put on GitHub. And again, a lot of the information here will be, uh, you know, cursory. Uh, if you need any deeper uh, understanding or deeper knowledge, or you want to try this out on your own websites, please do look at the uh, um, at this particular uh, document with the link shown here. Um, at the bottom uh, that kind of goes through all of these use cases in detail but essentially we saw that there was a gap between the actual uh, web authentic specification and being able to implement web Authent by relying parties or web developers and that's why we created this how to fido guide um, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about the how to fido guide and kind of taking pieces and use cases out of this uh, and discussing them in a little bit more detail so before we get to that, a uh, couple of like pieces of, of, of background here that we need to understand. The first one is let's talk a little bit about these authenticators, right? We've already in the earlier example, we've seen physical security keys there. Uh, that was in my example too, the little USB fob that you can plug into your, into your device that contains the user's uh, private keys. Um, that certainly is one type of authenticator um, that, that's available in, in FIDO um, you know, nomenclature today. That would be a device um, that typically works very well. It's on the lower right-hand side of my quadrant. That's a device that works very well for um, second factor authentication. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, right? That's a little removable USB device. Whenever a user goes to a new machine and wants to prove their identity, type username, type password, also plug in their security key. And you know, at the same time, they're defeating phishing, but also proving to the remote party that they, they are who they say they are, right? So a very standard second factor authenticator. Um, that's one implementation that, that we've seen a lot uh, in, in FIDO. The other implementation that we've seen a lot, and, and one that's very interesting and I want to talk more about today, is the one on the left upper side, the platform user verifying authenticator. Those are typically things like Windows Hello, Touch ID, Face ID, the fingerprint on Android. Um, those are the types of biometric authentication modalities that's also coupled to key stores on these various platforms, which uh, web properties can use pretty much today as a way to conveniently re-authenticate users into their web properties. Um, this use case is old, right? We all understand the use case of I have a phone, I download my favorite banking application onto it, I sign in with my username and my password today, and tomorrow when I come back, I can just put my fingerprint on a sensor and I'm logged back in, right? I'm kind of re-logging in. I've already bootstrapped, now I'm logging in. Um, and, and that uh, experience is something that the web Authent API brings to the web. So now it's not only the prerogative of um, applications running on phones to use the local biometrics, we can now also through the web Authent APIs offer that same experience to, um, to uh, websites, right? To web properties, both on mobile devices as well as on desktop and laptop devices that has local biometric modalities. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, I'm gonna briefly mention the other two uh, types of authenticators that we haven't discussed here. The roaming user verifying, that's a brand new type of uh, physical security key manifestation, um, which can also identify a user. How does it identify a user? Well, either you have to you know, authenticate to the local security key by using a PIN code, or the security key might have a fingerprint sensor that you can tap to actually activate it. So that means that we can actually get rid of usernames and passwords using this type of security key, because the security key has knowledge about the user's account and can identify the individual user in addition to being able to being a physical instantiation of like a second factor. So the something I have is my physical security key, and then the something I know is the pin, or the something I am is my fingerprint that I have to unlock the device with. So that's another interesting type of authenticator that we'll discuss. And then the last one I didn't mention yet on the left hand uh, lower side there is um, these 
smaller types of security keys that kind of fits almost permanently into our you know, USB ports uh, on, on our, our, our laptops or, or desktop devices. Um, not going to talk a whole lot about them today. Uh, if you are interested, feel free to throughout the, uh, the conversation here to, to put that in the, uh, in the chat box, and I'll try to, to answer some questions on that if you're interested. But that's more or less an enterprise type implementation um, where we use the security key as a kind of a defense in depth uh, uh, mechanism. So think about like I log into a service today, typing in my username, typing my password, and then you know exercising my second factor. At that point, a cookie or a token gets sent down to my local machine. How can the remote web server be certain a day or two later that the token that's being sent from my machine is still being sent from my machine and not from some other machine that was able to like exfiltrate it off my device? That's where the little small security key comes in, where um, on a regular basis, like maybe every hour or maybe eight, eight hours or 24 hours, the remote web server can ask for a signature of this local authenticator I have in my device to still, in addition to the token that's being sent, in addition to the cookie or the, let's say, OAuth token being sent, for also double checking that the user still has access to this physical piece of hardware that's tied to that particular user account. So more or less an enterprise use case, not gonna talk about that too much, but I just wanted to kind of like explain all the four different types of authenticators that we typically uh, address or try to address with Wibblethin and, and with FIDO. So some more high level observations before we start. Um, the first one is like, if you have a website or, or a web property or any kind of application with authentication, unless you really have a good reason for re-authenticating your users on a very frequent basis, um, try not to do that. Like at Google, for example, if you're a consumer and you're logging into Gmail, typically your session will live for a very, very, very long time. We won't really ever ask you for your password unless we're like uncertain about something. Um, and even if a user authenticated into a particular uh, web property, if they've proven their multi-factor status. Like let's say I'm trying to sign into my bank and I'm typing my username, my password, and they send me an OTP via text. And I type that OTP in. Um, there's really no reason when the same user comes back on the same machine a day later to keep asking them for their you know, second factor again. We've kind of already, with second factor, we're trying to prove possession of something. We've already proven possession of a mobile phone by typing in the message that came to the device. Once I type that into my laptop, my laptop now becomes that thing, right? And that same thing is gonna be present the next day when I come back to the session. So um, basically two things I wanna say here. The first one is unless you have a good reason, maybe financial or other you know, regulatory reason, keep your users logged in for longer times. Um, that kind of uh, you know, takes away that, that common uh, retyping, the users kind of being trained into typing their passwords you know, almost like hundreds of times a day. And then when the user gets uh, fielded with like a, a phishing website, chances are higher that they're just indiscriminately give away their password. So challenging users for password fewer times is actually good. And secondly, also, even if you have to challenge users for passwords all the time, um, try not to keep challenging them for their MFA. Uh, I think one of the key problems we're seeing with MFA today is that users see this as a big inconvenience because in some cases we're asking for MFA even though we don't really need it, even though there might be other passive signals we could be using. So those are kind of like the two things uh, I just want to call out before we start, which is kind of embedded in, in, in the rest of the assumptions uh, throughout the deck. Um, one piece of terminology, before we get into the use cases here is uh, something I like to call account bootstrapping. Uh, I've referred to this already a little bit earlier in the deck here. Uh, account bootstrapping is when we talk about a user signing into an account on a device for the very first time. Like I buy a new laptop, I get a new phone, I'm trying to sign into that device, I've never signed into it before. So the remote party has no idea who the user is. They have no inkling, right? There's no other identifying information from that device that kind of tells them that I'm the person that's gonna log in on this device. That's typically where accounts are the most vulnerable, right? The web property has no idea um, and no way to discriminate like a good user from a bad one. They just have to trust what the user is presenting. So bootstrapping is when, you know, we don't have cookies, we don't have OS tokens, we have no idea who the user is. Um, and, you know, typical account bootstrapping might also contain some account recovery steps. Like, like maybe the user is trying to sign in, but they can't remember their password. Maybe we have to send them through account recovery. So that, you know, is all part of the account bootstrapping process for letting a remote party know that, hey, it's a brand new user uh, or, or a new user on a, on, a, on, a, on a machine that's trying to sign in. Um, and, and I think that's really where a lot of the phishing protections focus, because that's typically what an attacker would look like. An attacker that's trying to, you know, sign in as you on one of their devices will typically look like an account bootstrapping um, to, to a relying party. So 
Let's now start with a couple of use cases here um, that's taken directly out of the, the How to FIDO guide um, for web properties that's interested in starting to use FIDO and WebAuthn in their own uh, implementations. And our first foray into the land of passwordless really is with what we call user reauthentication. So that is when a user is already signed in. Like let's say on day zero, they get a new device, they sign in, they type their username, they type their password, uh, they're fully signed into your web property. At that point in time, you can actually issue a particular WebAuthn JavaScript call on the browser called publickeycredential.ease user verifying platform authenticator available. That's like a mouthful. Shorthand for that is UVPAA. Basically, that returns a Boolean that'll tell you whether the platform that the user is currently on supports FIDO features um, as a way to log that user in in the future without typing a password, right? It tells you whether there's a platform authenticator, some built-in modality, some built-in biometric or other modality in that platform that you can uh, that you can utilize. That's a silent call. The user doesn't see anything. But once you get a true uh, back from that uh, particular call, you're then free to actually engage uh, with the user and tell them, hey, do you want to you know, upsell them essentially? Do you want to next time you come to this property, just type your fingerprint or you know, show your face to sign in to this particular web property? Um, so essentially, like you can serve the user some kind of like an opt-in, like that skip the password, uh, you know, uh, demonstration or little example I have there. Um, and at that point in time, after the user has, as uh, you know, said yes, I want to sign in next time coming to this website without a password, you can call uh, navigatorcredentials.create, um, and basically it'll look something like this. And again, all these are in the uh, the How to FIDO guide, so you can copy and paste from there. But essentially, you call the create call with a couple of parameters. Um, you know, what RP you are, um, you know, some information about the user, cryptographic challenge, uh, a bunch of like standard uh, parameters there. And then you'll tell the system that you're looking for an authenticator that's built into the platform. You're not looking for a physical removable security key. Back to my quadrant earlier, we're looking for something of the type top left. We're looking for a platform authenticator that's built into the platform. Remember, we already know it's here because we issued the Ease UVPIA, and we want this thing to be able to identify the user individually. What does that mean? That means that it's not something that'll just like, you know, like a security key where you just tap it and it logs you in. In this case, it actually has the ability to identify an individual user. So it has like maybe biometrics uh, or it has like a knowledge factor that you have to enter before unlocking it. So that's essentially the type of authenticator we're looking for for this particular use case. Once you've registered it, you'll get back some information, including a public key. Uh, and then later on, when this user comes back to your website, let's say you're back, right? And the user logged in on the first day, type the username, type their password, type their second factor, whatever way you authenticate them, uh, you register their public key. Now they come back a week later on the same sheet. When they come back, you now know, oh yeah, this user wasn't this machine before because maybe you put down a cookie. Um, and all you now have to do to authenticate the user is you can make another WebAuthn call, uh, this time using the get property to actually authenticate and make sure that yes, the same private key is still present on the system and that the user did their local unlock gesture. Like they touched their fingerprint, they showed their face, they typed in their PIN code, whatever the case might be. So both of these things are, are validated at the point in time when you do the special web authen get call. Uh, here's a quick example of how we implemented it at Google. Uh, when you go to passwords at google.com on an Android phone on the web, we'll do this whole sequence. We'll do a get call. Uh, you have to set some special parameters, which I'll show here. Um, you'll do the get call, uh, you send in the credential ID. So earlier on, when you made the credential, you get an ID back, you need to remember it. You need to say what type of transports. So basically you wanna deal with a platform authenticator or something that's built in. So you specify that in, in, in the call. And again, you also again say that you want user verification. You don't wanna have anyone that's working on that machine to be able to get in. You want the user that actually owns that device, that have their fingerprint registered, that have their face registered on that device to be able to get into your property. So that's all the, um, the, the parameters that you need to set in order to, to do this properly. So that's a very easy use case that can be done today. Uh, we have many examples of, of web properties that's done this before. I know a, a nice one that you can uh, certainly Google is eBay. Uh, eBay did an implementation of this that works really well. Uh, and essentially, if you return to, on the same device to, to that website, um, you can just sign in using a biometric. So very, very uh, standard use case and very similar to the one um, that we've seen on mobile phones with apps for, for a really long time. So really nice use case that you can enable. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about phishing resistant second factors as my second user journey, right? Um, that is the, remember my quadrant, uh, lower right hand uh, quadrant, the one that we spoke about first. That is when I have a very, very high profile web service, like or website. 
Uh, maybe I'm a bank, uh, you know, maybe we're Google, um, you know, maybe Facebook or Twitter. Um, and you want to protect your users against getting fished. Maybe it's in high profile accounts. Uh, and the way in which you can do that is by issuing your users or asking them to get hold of a FIDO compatible security key. This is a physical thing uh, that the user can buy as long as it's FIDO compatible, it will work. Uh, and essentially, um, what we're doing is we're upgrading the user security for their account by not only requiring a username and a password, or maybe some fishable form of multi-factor like OTP codes or push or something, we're actually going one step further and we're upgrading their security key to oh, their security to phishing resistant security by um, giving them the security key and asking them to register this on their particular account for this web property. Um, yes, you can still have other fallback methods on the account, uh, but of course, you know, if you're an attacker, you're probably going to be looking for those and kind of downgrading the security of the user to those. Uh, and at Google, we have this thing called the Advanced Protection Program, where the only way you can log into that account is by having your security key ready. Um, and the way you'd opt into this uh, would be kind of very similar. Um, you'd call navigator.credentials.create, just as in the earlier example here. But this time, your parameters that you issue this call with will look slightly different. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you can kind of see there the way that we are is illustrating this to the user uh, on, on Google accounts. You'll have like you know a list of different security keys that you can add to your account. And the user can typically have as many as they want. And they just have to have one of these present uh, during bootstrapping. And the way that this would work is we issue create, a couple of additional calls here. When we issue the call, we'd saying, we'll be saying that we actually we're looking for a cross-platform um, type of authenticator. Uh, they're on the right-hand side under authenticator selection. We're saying we want something that's not built into the platform because remember, if it was built in, when the user goes to a new device to bootstrap, they'd be out of luck, right? Because they can't take their old device to their new device to show it its platform authenticator. You're really looking for something that the user can carry around between different devices. So looking for a cross-platform implementation here. Um, and then on the, on the left-hand side, those are a little bit more unimportant, but essentially we'd be coming in and we'd be telling the system not to register any credentials that already exist. The only reason we're doing that is we don't want you to accidentally register your same security key twice on the same property. So that's what the exclude list is about. You can read more about that in the How to Fido document. But essentially, the important piece here is you're making a credential and you're explicitly making it cross-platform. You're not giving the user the choice to register something internal because at that point, when they bootstrap a new device, it's not going to be available. So cross-platform is, is really the important part uh, in, in this particular example. And then, of course, when the user needs to sign in, when it comes to signing time, you'll be issuing a get call at this point in time. And the get call will have some system UI um, that will kind of come up automatically, that will tell the user how to activate their, 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 their different types of security keys. If it's Bluetooth, there will be some instructions to pair. If it's NFC, it'll kind of tell you to tap it to the back of your device. If it supports NFC and USB, you'll have this kind of like standard dialogue coming up uh, from the browser or the system that will prompt the user to activate their particular key. Um, and the way that you'd, you'd uh, you know, utilize that is instead of doing a create, of course, now you'll be doing a get call, navigator.credentials.get. You'll pass in all the credentials you know about, um, and essentially you'll be waiting for a signature to come back. And once the signature comes back, you've validated, as we saw in my earlier kind of flow diagram, you'll be checking things like is the signature correct? Um, you know, is it over the right you know, challenge? Is it done with the right private key? And also, like, is everything else in the signature right? Like, does it come from the right origin and all the other stuff? And at that point in time, you're pretty sure it's the right user and the user was not on a phishing website at the point in time when they were trying to sign in. So that's kind of like, you know, covering the left, upper, and the bottom right-hand corner of my quadrant. Now, let's look at one more quadrant uh, before we... Uh, Go to the next section here, um, and that quadrant is about the user verifying roaming authenticators. Now these are brand new. Um, this is something that you know we're seeing uh, more and more authenticator vendors kind of investing in these types of devices. These devices have storage; uh, they can keep your accounts on them, so they'll know, you know, for example, not only about like a private key you have, but they'll also know that this private key belongs to Google, and it's my you know. Christian at google.com account that's linked to this particular key. All that information is stored on the key, and the key can also uniquely identify the user. What does this mean? It really means that we can stop asking the user for usernames because the key can provide that information to the browser for then you know, sending it onto the relying party. And we also don't need to ask the user for a password because the key can identify the user individually or uniquely. I have to touch my fingerprint on the key or I have to type in my PIN code. Now, you, know, you might ask, well, if the user is just typing a PIN code, how is that any better than a password? Well, the thing here is that PIN code is a single PIN code that unlocks the whole key. 
So even if I have one key and I use it with 50 different accounts, I'll be using the same pin code for all the accounts. And it's not password reuse because the pin code is used locally to unlock the authenticator. It's never sent to the remote party. And unless some attacker physically gets hold of my key and knows my pin code or can touch my fingerprint, they cannot you know, log into my account because they don't have the private key material that's needed for, for assigning the user in. So these are kind of like the next generation um, authenticators that, that we're starting to see pop up. Um, and these really start to um, you know, open the world to, to true passwordless experiences. And that first example where we're just upstepping and using our biometric to re-log in, remember if the user goes to a brand new machine, they're still gonna fall back to a password. So it doesn't really change the security model much. Here, we're really talking about devices that can allow the user to log in completely without usernames and passwords and they go even to a brand new machine. Um, but of course, the drawback there is you're gonna have to get your users to physically buy and, and, and use and carry these devices. So we're still looking at one more use case coming up uh, where, where that would not be a, a requirement. But certainly for high security and, and high risk users, uh, especially in the enterprise, this might be a very, very good example. And uh, folks that's familiar with like smart card technologies, this is much more similar uh, to the traditional like smart card model that we used to have where you unlock the card and then present your information uh, to the remote server. Um, and, and you know, the only, I guess, the big benefit here is, of course, this is now built straight into the platform. So no weird like smart card drivers or things you have to install. And of course, this works across the board on pretty much all popular uh, computing devices. So whether it's iPhone or Mac or Android or Chrome OS, like all these technologies are, are pretty much uh, supported. Although there's a little asterisk with Android here, some of these technologies are still rolling out there. Um, so then we'll briefly look at how to register such a type of authenticator. Um, remember, it's gonna be very, very uh, similar to the second factor external device. Uh, it's gonna be one little difference, but we'll look at that in a second. Um, here's kind of an example of how you can present this to a user. You can kind of upsell them and say, hey, do you wanna set up signing in without a password? And if the user says yes, then of course you'll, you'll initiate this, this type of flow. Um, you'll again do a navigator credentials create, but this time you will set the parameters just a teeny bit differently. Um, and you'll recall earlier when you registered the second factor key, everything looked pretty similar. The really only big difference here is this require resident key and also the user verification fields. Here we're saying we really need user verification because we want to do away with the password. The password was the previous way that you did user verification. Now you want to offload that to the key. So you want the key to be able to verify the user through a PIN or a biometric or whatever. And also the require resident key, we set that to true because we want the key to be able to identify the user and have the account information so the browser can present it to them next time. And we'll, we'll see that in a second. So both of these properties we set to true. And of course, we still set cross-platform because we want an external device that the user can then go and use um, you know, as they you know, transition to new computing devices uh, in, in their life cycle. Um, now the problem is like, how do you choose between UVRAs, which is the user verifying roaming authenticator, the one we just looked at, and the second factory use case? Um, so my best answer to this is you don't have to, right? If you're a website and you just wanna offer your user the best experience, what you can do is you can actually just during the registration, when the user says, I wanna register a new security key, you can tell the system to give you back whatever the best thing is the user has available. So you can tell it that you'd prefer a user verifying roaming authenticator, something that can store the user ID and something that can verify the user individually. But if the user doesn't have one of those devices, you'll take whatever you can get. You'll even take the second factor old school security key um, credentials. And when you get information back after the register call, you can decide what you wanna do. Like you'll know which one of these you got back. So you can decide that, oh yeah, if the user just registered using a second factor, um, you know, you're still gonna need to prompt them for a username and a password when they sign in. Or if you get back a UVRA response, um, you'll know that next time the user comes to sign in on a new device, um, you actually don't even have to ask them for, for a username or a password because all this information would be available. And you can also discriminate based on these, right? Uh, also earlier on when you did the registration, if you require a resident key, but the key can't give it to you, the user will see an error. Uh, in this particular case, um, what we'll see here in a couple of seconds is you can decide um, you know, whether you wanna be that descriptive or whether you just want the device or the service to give you back whatever it can. Uh, and that's kind of like the recommendation we're making, unless you want to really live in a world where your users don't ever have to deal with passwords again, in which case you wanna force, as we saw in the earlier example, the, the UVRA. Um, so essentially, if we look here, as I say there in the last bullet point, uh, you know, we'll do a, a resident discoverable key and we'll do like a best effort mode, a preferred mode here in the in the, uh, the code sample. Everything looks very much the same as earlier. 
But here you'll see two different things. You'll see the resident key requirement is preferred and the user verification is preferred. And then whatever the key can give you, it'll give you back. And we also ask for a specific extension this time. And that extension is necessary because we want the key to be able to tell you what it gave you. Otherwise, you're just going to get some response and you won't really know. Did the key do user verification? Can the key store resident keys? We don't know. Credit props or credential properties gives you some additional information back that tells you what was actually achieved when, when you spoke to the key. So that's kind of pretty important. And again, this is called out in more detail in the uh, how to find a document as well. And then the last one, which I think is really interesting is, well, we really want to live in a world without passwords, um, maybe even without usernames. But the challenge is we're never going to get all users in the world to carry keys, right? That's just not going to happen. But users already carry computing devices with them wherever they go. They have phones. Um, and what if the mobile phone that the user already carries can start to act as a UVRA? Now, one of the key problems is how do you attach your phone to a laptop or a desktop? Um, and for FIDO, it's pretty important that you have some local attachment, right? FIDO is based on local connectivity and proximity. That's the thing that gives you the phishing resistance. Um, so we can't really just talk via cloud. We really need some local connectivity. Um, and there's a couple of ways in which one can do that, right? Uh, we have like physical cables to a device, you know, not so user friendly. Um, another option might be using Bluetooth, something that we've been actively looking in lately in FIDO. Um, so we're kind of thinking that in the future, uh, the mechanism of attachment will probably be some kind of like a Bluetooth link between the device, uh, the computing device and, and the mobile phone, um, where you can then register the phone as a user verifying roaming authenticator. Um, and there's a couple of different ways in which, you know, in the specification that's being described, the way that you can do it. Of course, one of the easiest ways would be, let's say I'm on my phone and I download my bank's application or I go to my banking website, www.mybank.com. On my phone, I get a prompt that says, hey, do you want to skip the password next time? I say yes. At that point in time, I register a local FIDO credential on my phone. So next time I come back on the same phone to that banking website, I can just touch my fingerprint. But imagine if that credential is now actually made available over Bluetooth so that in the future, any device that's in range and paired with my phone um, can actually utilize that same credential. So tomorrow I might be going to mybank.com on my laptop and my laptop can reach out to my phone, figure out there is already credential for my bank here. And then instead of having to like type usernames and passwords, I can just approve that login with my fingerprint on my phone in an unfishable or a phishing resistant, called phishing resistant way. Um, and, and that's kind of the future of this protocol, right? And we already have built all these hooks into the protocol, or most of them. Um, the way that this registration would work, of course, the first thing we do is we issue an easy user for verifying platform authenticator uh, call on the local phone because we want to register the key. Uh, and you know, folks can maybe say that, well, if it's an app on the phone, you can already do all of this stuff. Why do FIDO? Well, the nice thing about like moving to FIDO over just using the local biometric APIs on the phone is if you use FIDO to handle all of this for you in the future, when these credentials do become available over Bluetooth, you'll be able to use them immediately um, on you know, any other computing device the user has. It's trying to access that same web property. So kind of really truly upstepping the user into a passwordless world uh, without the need for any other discrete authenticators. And typically the way that we'll do this is we'll call Navigator Credentials Create. Um, you know, on that device, on the phone itself, again, we'll set, you know, the platform, the authenticator attachment to platform because we're creating it on the phone. We'll set require resident key because we want to identify the user without the need for a password. Uh, in, in user verification for require resident key, of course, we want to do, you know, um, username list type setups where the, the phone or the authenticator can tell you about all the accounts that it has available. And once you do this, you're going to get back some information. Uh, and the information that you're going to get back after registration will contain the transports. Basically, it'll tell you how this credential can be exercised in the future. Now, if you register a platform authenticator, you're always going to get back an internal transport. That tells you the key or the, the, the authenticator can be exercised internally. But what you should be looking out for, you should also be looking out for additional transports, BLE, which is Bluetooth Low Energy, or maybe even Cable, which is a new protocol that we're working uh, in FIDO on. And Cable is kind of like stands for uh, Cloud Assisted Bluetooth Pairing. So the idea would be that, you know, you kind of have some information going through the cloud, but some information going locally. So you have that presence detection, but you don't have to go through the traditional like Bluetooth pairing steps uh, because we know a lot of users drop off there. So these are newer things we're working on in FIDO. And essentially what that will enable you, it will enable other devices that's not physically the phone itself to wirelessly reach out to the phone and exercise some of the credentials you have for passwordless type of bootstraps. And the question then is, well, how do you, how will you sign in once you've registered these credentials? Well, typically the way that you would do this is you'll you know, um, tell the user, hey, do you want to type a username in one option or in another option? 
why don't you just like skip the password and sign in without a username or a password? And if you click on that particular button, the system will issue a get call with no allow list. You just won't say anything to the, to the system. You'll just say, hey, I want the credential. I don't care which one, you figure it out. And I want user verification on that credential. And what will then happen is your browser or your user agent will actually step in. It'll present you a list of all the available credentials either locally or you know, on devices in proximity that you, know, you have a relationship with. And at that point in time, the user can pick any of those accounts, just touch their fingerprint, and they'd be magically signed in. Um, so that's kind of like the experience uh, in the future that we're aiming for. Um, we, we looked at four separate use cases, you remember, uh, the re-authentication step, the second factor step, uh, the UVRA, physical keys, and then the phone one. Of these four, the phone one is the only one that's kind of like still in progress, but I did want to kind of give a quick indication of how that would work. All three of the others are already available today, and you can actually start you know, working um, with those on your web properties. I did want to kind of allude to that fourth one, because if you adopt WebAuthn and Fido today, that experience will basically become available to you as soon as the relevant um, you know, kind of foundational elements and the infrastructure has been has been set up, uh, and we're continuously working on that in, in WebAuthn, uh, which you can follow on GitHub uh, as well as in the in the Fido Alliance. So with that, I hope that gives you a, a good overview of you know how all these different things hang together. Um, and I wanted to have an apply slide here and kind of just you know give some quick next steps on what you can do in the meantime. Uh, IBM is a pretty nice Fido server implementing most of these use cases in the How to Fido document uh, at that particular URL there. Um, you know, you can come and peruse the, the document that I've discussed and even contribute. Uh, if you have some, uh, some additional ideas or some questions, feel free to, um, to ask them directly on GitHub. Uh, you can play with a, a FIDO server that Google has set up, an open source one on GitHub. Um, and finally, we have some code labs also um, where you can play around with some of these APIs on Android. One thing that I didn't mention earlier is remember that all of these web APIs that we have on Android that you can call via the browser, they have parallels on the Android system as well. So if you have an Android app, you don't have to keep integrating with the key store and with biometric prompts and things directly. You can actually be using the FIDO APIs in your own applications as well. And then you'll get keys that's essentially shared between your app, between your website on the browser, and in the future, even on other devices, which can then kind of be accessed over this uh, over this Bluetooth or, or wireless links that, that we're working on. So with that, I hope that was interesting. Uh, if you folks have any questions, please feel free to ask them, and I'll try my best to try and answer. Thank you.